Paul says there is one body. I'm in the chapter, the fourth chapter, the fourth verse. There is one body and one spirit, even as you also were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, remember yesterday that I was talking to the gentleman that wrote about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, as he called it, or the Holy Spirit, and I explained what uh, Luke had to say about the conversion of Cornelius in the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, and I made the statement at that time, if we have two baptisms, it will contradict what the Apostle Paul said right here where he says there is but one. Now, if people receive the Holy Ghost baptism, as they refer to it, and water baptism at the very same time, that looks to me like there's two baptisms. That contradicts what Paul said when he said there is but one. All right, now, if there is a Baptist faith, and a Methodist faith, and a Presbyterian faith, and a Catholic, and a Jewish, and I could go on and on, can you not see that this contradicts what the Apostle Paul said when he said there is but one faith? Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, about verse 10 and 11, the Apostle Paul says, It has been told me, brethren, right into the church at Corinth, by the household of Chloe, that there's divisions among you. Now, Paul says, I command you, brethren, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the very same thing. Now, I don't have license to believe anything that I want to. And you don't have license to believe anything that you want to. In other words, if you're a Christian, you're a Christian simply because you are a disciple of Jesus Christ. And a disciple of Jesus Christ is a learner, a follower, a student, a scholar of Jesus. Someone that recognizes that Jesus is Lord, that he has the authority to simply speak, and we as his disciples listen and we obey. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot read your Bible and come up with one idea, and I read it and come up with another idea, if both of us read it alike. And this is all I'm pleading for. I realize that we have gotten so far away from this Bible that it doesn't mean anything. In other words, we're simply saying that it's a good book, but there's a lot of good books. Maybe parts of it are inspired, but some of it are not, is not, uh, some parts are not inspired. And therefore, uh, you can believe it or you can disbelieve it. You can regard it or you can disregard it. You can do it if you happen to like it. Or if you don't, you can just sim simply circumvent it or go around on the other side of it and leave it aside. I don't believe that. That's not the approach and that's not the attitude I have. My attitude is that this book is God's divine revelation from heaven to earth. I believe that it's the message that we've got to accept in order to be saved. I don't believe that God has any other record, he has any other message relative to the scheme of redemption than this Bible. And therefore, when we do what this Bible says, we will please God. And when we don't do what this Bible said, we're displeasing to God. Now, I know that back in Deuteronomy and also in the book of Proverbs and in the last chapter of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, in all of these three different places, God says that we're to add nothing and take nothing from his word. And he makes the statement that if any man adds to his word, God will add to his name the plagues that are written in this book. If we take away from this book, God will take away our name from the book of life and our right to eat of the tree of life. Now, it looks to me like that God places great importance on this word and that we are to leave it just exactly like it is. I'm not to add to it. I'm not to diminish from it. I'm not to change it in any way. Now, people, how can you claim to be honest? How can you claim to be intelligent when you simply have your Bibles there before you right now and your Bible reads exactly like my Bible and all of them read just alike, just alike when Paul says that there is but one faith. Now, I don't believe people. I, I just don't believe that we're going to be able to plead ignorance in the day of judgment when we've got this book. Now, Romans 10, verse 17 says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's impossible to please God without faith. We cannot have faith without doing what God said and listening to it. If we listen to him, then we'll do what he said. If we don't do what he says... We simply do not have faith because we're not doing what God said. Now, we can pervert it. We can change it. We can argue about it. But the truth of the matter, that's the way it is. Now, when we tell our child to do something and he refuses to do it and we look over at him and say, did you hear what I said? 
And he said, yes, I heard what you said. Then we come back and say, apparently you didn't because you're not paying any attention to it. I'm not talking about simply the audible uh, vibrations of sound bouncing off of your eardrums. That's not what Jesus meant when he said that you've got to hear. He simply says that you've got to observe, you've got to do, you've got to respect, you've got to understand what I say. And if a person doesn't, then of course, how in the name of reason can that individual claim to be right? But now, the good lady says again, why do you talk so harsh about our faith? Well, in the first place, I don't believe that a man can preach the gospel without exposing error. The apostle Paul did, Jesus did, all of them did. As a matter of fact, that's why the early disciples got into so much trouble. This is why Jesus was nailed to the cross. This is why Stephen was stoned in the seventh chapter of the book of Acts, simply because he exposed error. You see that? I cannot preach the truth without exposing error. And when you talk about our faith, then I don't have any respect for your faith. Now, if your faith is, is what the Bible says, the one that you're talking about in Ephesians 4, 4, that's a different story. But now let me say, if I come across as somewhat harsh, I'll apologize for that. I have no desire to do that. But if you're confusing straightforward, simple talk, Bible talk with harshness, then the problem lies with you, not me. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I've got a responsibility to speak. And at the very same time, you've got a responsibility to listen. If I am conscious, cognizant, of the spirit in which I am to preach, and if you are cognizant of the spirit in which you are to listen, then of course we won't have any problems. You see what I'm talking about? Now, if you feel that we're so wrong, why not pray? Why not pray for us? Well, in the first place, ladies and gentlemen, we don't know what prayer is all about. You remember in John chapter 9, about verse 31, Jesus says, We know that God heareth not the prayers of a sinner. In other words, prayer belongs to a child of God. Well, someone said, Brother Rudd, you claim to be a child of God. Why can't you pray? Well, I cannot pray for God to do something contrary to his will. Now, I know that he's not going to save people contrary to the plan of salvation that is laid down in the Bible. And therefore, how can I pray for people unless I simply pray that they will have an open mind, and this I do every day. Now, good lady, I can assure you that I never pray to God, and there's not a day goes by but what I do not utter prayer after prayer to God, that I pray that God will bless this broadcast, that he will bless the people that are listening, that he'll open the hearts and the minds of people that they can understand this. Now, this is what we are to do. Now, turn with me, if you will, over here in the 14th chapter of the book of John. I alluded to this somewhat uh, earlier in our broadcast, and I'm just talking simple now because I, I've got a feeling that this good lady is interested, and I believe that this lady is a candidate becoming a child of God. Now, I don't believe that she's a Christian yet. Don't believe that. But I believe that if she'll continue to listen, and if she'll get self out of the picture and simply say, Lord, here I am. Now, you tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Now, you go to the Bible and find out what God says. Then I believe that this good lady can become a child of God. Now, turn with me into John 14, verse 21, and listen to me very briefly. He that hath my commandments, now this is Jesus talking. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Now, what does that say? Listen to me well. Think seriously. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Well, now, if you don't keep my commandments, then apparently what Jesus is saying is, you don't love me. You see that? In other words, if the proof of our love to Jesus is that we keep his commandments, then how can we claim to love him when we fly in the face of his commandments and refuse to do what he said? Now, listen again. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. All right, now, if Jesus will not love people, I'm talking about respect them, accept them, upon their conditions unless they keep his commandments, then how can God love people? Well, someone says, Brother Rudd, I never thought about it. Well, let's look at it again. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him. 
I will manifest myself unto him. Now, that's plain. That's simple. Now, in verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my word. If a man love me, he will keep my word. Now, let's see. Let's, let's just pick out one or two words of Jesus. In Luke 13, 3 and Luke 13, 5, Jesus says, Nay, I say, except you repent, you shall perish. Now, what is repentance? Repentance is a change of mind which results in a change of life. You've been living in open rebellion to God's law. You change your mind. You say, I'm not going to do that anymore. And that results in a change of your life. You look at your life and you say, I've never been scripturally baptized. And now then, you say, I realize that Jesus says that I've got to be born again. I realize that he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. And therefore, I'm going to be baptized. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't do that, then how can you say that you love Jesus? Look what he said. If a man love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him and will come unto him and make our abode with him. But on the other hand, if you don't keep my word, my Father will not come to you, I will not come to you, we will not make our abode with you. Now, that's how simple it is. Now, there's one thing. You either accept this or you reject this, and if you don't accept it, it's simply because you don't believe the Bible. And this is exactly what I'm saying. Now, people, the problem today is not ignorance. We're living in one of the most liberate countries that the world's ever seen. Now, don't tell me that people can't understand. The thing that's wrong with the American people is simply we're rebellious. We've got our hearts set against God. We want to do what we want to do irrespective and regardless of what God says. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the thing that's going to send us to hell. We don't want to be called Christians like they were in Antioch. We don't want to be born again like Jesus said that we had to. He, he, we don't want to take the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week like the early disciples did. We don't want to be faithful and, and attend every service of the church like the Apostle Paul said we ought to in Hebrews 10 verse 25. We don't want to hear the gospel, believe it, repent of our sins, confess and be baptized. We don't want to put him above everything else. We want to do our thing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we have permitted this individual freedom to send us to hell. And we're going to hell just as straight as we possibly can. Now turn with me. Let me show you what's wrong with the world. I'll tell you exactly what's wrong with the world. Turn to the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation. In the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, John said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. But in chapter 20, he said, I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he lay hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and cast him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him that he should deceive the nations no more until the thousand years should be finished. After this, he must be loose for a little time. I don't care what these modern-day evangelists are saying, ladies and gentlemen. The devil is a spirit, and the only thing that can, uh, that can bind him is the Word of God. In other words, this chain right here that you see in this angel's hand is the Word of God. And therefore, the Word of God, just as used by Jesus in the third chapter of the book of Matthew, in the fourth chapter, I'm talking about the wilderness, when he said, it's written, get thee behind me, is the only thing that can bind Satan. All right, now, Satan was bound. As long as people respected this book, Satan was bound. And figuratively, that was a thousand years. But now look down in verse 7. He said, and when the thousand years are finished... Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall come forth to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth. Gog and Magog to gather them together to the war, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is the little season. Notice you said, notice up here in verse 3, he should deceive the nations until the thousand years should be finished. After this, he must be loose for a little time. Now, we're living in this little time. We're living in the time in which the devil, Satan, is loosed. And the only thing that can bind him is the Bible. And that means that the Bible has been destroyed as far as the power of binding Satan is concerned. And therefore, just exactly as I said, we don't have any respect for this Bible. And therefore, the devil is doing and sowing in our minds anything that he wants to. Now, in the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew, the parable of the tares, you remember that Jesus says that while man slept, the enemy came, which is the devil, and sowed tares among the wheat. Now, brethren, 
This is exactly what happens. We're not hearing preaching like this. We don't hear preachers anymore get up and preach like they did 50, 7,500 years ago. What are we doing? Well, everything is psychology. Everything is talk shows. Everything is simply trying to make people feel better. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we don't need to feel better in our sins. We need someone that tells us that we're going as straight to hell as a martin to our box. And we need to make people, we need the people to make us understand that unless we repent, we will perish. We need people to stir us up and let us know that God still rules this universe. And that one of these days he will destroy this world by fire just exactly like he did under Noah with water. We've got to understand that God can destroy cities just like he did Sodom and Gomorrah. We've got to know that God has the power and the desire and the will to cast people out of his presence that rebel against him just like he did those rebellious angels. And all we've got to do to understand that is to turn to Second Peter chapter 3 and Titus are in, in uh, Jude the first, those, that one chapter there in the book of Jude. Now the reason why we don't want this is simply because we've closed this book. And this is what people don't want. Just like the gentleman yesterday that talks about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Or just like the man that wrote and asked me to explain 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 29 and 30. And the Mormons come along here and say that we're to be baptized for the dead. They had one woman out in Salt Lake City that were baptized for some 3,000 people the last time I heard. And anybody with one eye and half sense that'll use the half of the eye and the half of the sense he's got knows that Christianity is a personal individual and that nobody can obey the gospel for somebody else. Ladies and gentlemen, when you cast this Bible aside, then, of course, and open the floodgates and the waters begin to rush in. There is no end. There's no end to the era. And that's exactly what happened. It's crept into the churches. I'm talking about the churches of Christ. I'm not talking about the sectarian. Our brethren don't preach the gospel anymore. I can't understand why it's any harder for a man to preach like this than it is to get up here and talk like Donahue or anybody else, a bunch of Tom Brewer that won't save anybody. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. You can clean up the slums. You can put every prostitute out of business. You can clean up all the street gangs and steal the people in the world and they're lost and they're going to go to hell. They're not going to go to hell because they're prostitutes. They're not going to go to hell because you're using drugs. They're not going to go to hell because they're drinking. They're going to go to hell because they're not in Christ Jesus. And everybody that's not in the church is going to be lost. Now, of course, when you get into the church, you're in the church because you're converted. And when you're converted, you're going to quit your prostituting and you're going to quit your drug using, and you're going to quit your stealing and lying and cursing and everything else. But I'm simply saying if you could get everybody to straighten their life up, and we had an absolutely 100% moral world, you'd still have a world that's lost, that's hopeless and helpless and hapless before God because they're not in Christ. You understand what I'm talking about? Now, ladies and gentlemen, we've got the cart before the horse, and the thing we need to do is to get this thing right, and we've got to have some preachers that'll sit behind microphones and get behind pulpits and lectrum and get in pulpits and tell the people exactly what's going to send them to hell. We're sinners, and we're sinners because we've transgressed God's law, and we're transgressing God's law when we've refused to listen to what he said. And when we let people come up here as if it's nothing, and talk about my faith and your faith and the Baptist faith and the Methodist faith and the Presbyterian faith. And you do this and I do that and you're honest and you're honest. And let me talk in tongues and let me shout and let me carry on a bunch of tomfoolery when the Bible says that God is not a God of confusion. Then, ladies and gentlemen, this is why we've got the confusion that we've got in the world right now. I say that it's high time that we get us a group of men, and I'm going to say young men, because I've lost all faith in the bunch of the old ones around here. They're not going to preach God's law, and we're going to have to raise up a young generation that has respect for the Bible that will bear down on it like the God of heaven intended it to be. And we're not going to have that until we get a bunch of you soft soap and pushy foot members of the church that sit out there that droll over this stuff, and you like it, and you bask in this kind of stuff until you demand Bible preaching not going to have it until somebody demands it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just like Joshua. You can make up your mind what you want to do. You can serve the God of the Amorites and the Moabites and all of them on the east side of the Jordan. Joshua said, but for me and my house, we're going to serve God. Now, if you preachers listening to me, and if the members of you preachers are listening to me, if you want to sell your soul for a little pot of soup like Esau did, that's your business. Ladies and gentlemen, life is too short, eternity too long, heaven too fine, and hell too hot 
for Don Rudd to sell his soul and begin to back off simply because people don't want the truth. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I love your soul. I wouldn't be preaching this way. This is not popular preaching. People don't like this preaching. Why? Because they don't like the truth. Jesus told me a long time ago, just like he told you and he told the apostles, that the world won't accept you. They wouldn't accept me. They persecuted me. They'll persecute you. They kill me. They'll kill you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me emphasize that the majority has always been wrong. The majority was wrong in the antediluvian world when God destroyed the world, saved eight. The majority was wrong when Moses led those two million, which was not a drop in the bucket to the population of the world, out of the land of Egypt into the land of Canaan. Ladies and gentlemen, not only that, but the majority of them ended up wrong. In the case of Jesus, the very same thing is true in the early church, in the case of the Apostle Paul, in all the sacred history that we have. The majority has always been wrong. Now, what are we going to do? We're simply to go back to the Bible and simply say, Lord, give me the ability to understand it. Give me the wisdom to understand it. Give me the desire, first of all. And the Bible said, if any man willeth to do his will, he'll know the truth. Now, good people, like this lady right here, and I say good because she's listening to the broadcast, listening to a religious uh, program, because she's religious in nature. Now, brethren, let me, let me say this. The congregation where I preach is a new congregation. We have just started it. We're less than two, three years old. There's about 25 or 30 people, four, five, six, seven families of people. I look out at those people, and almost without an exception to the rule, the entire congregation is made up of people that were converted when I was on this radio broadcast the time before. Now, I, I believe with all of my heart that there's still good, honest people out yonder. I believe that there's good, honest people listening to me. When I was on the radio before, I'd have people to call up just like this lady and say, You know, Mr. Rudd, I'm a Baptist. I've been listening to you, and if what you say is true, then I'm wrong. Or I'm this, and I realize now that when I was baptized, I was not scripturally baptized, and I think that I ought to be baptized. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're not playing games. I, I'm not a professional. I'm not playing games. There's lots of things that I could do other than preach the gospel. But ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing important in this life but living the Christian life. Jesus said if a man were to gain the whole world and lose his soul, what is a gain? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? When it comes time for us to die, and that's right around the corner, when we look back on all the accomplishments, all the cars, the houses, the money, the prestige, the friends, the honors that maybe we have received, when we leave it all behind, what have we gained? You know, when Jesus sent the disciples out in the world, and they came back and they were so elated and carried away that they had power over demons, Jesus says, don't get excited about that. The thing that you need to rejoice about is that your name is written in the book of life. Now, brethren, friends, ladies and gentlemen, that's the only thing that's important. Is your name written in the book of life? According to Revelation 20:12, in the day of judgment, the books are going to be open. You will stand there as an individual. You will be judged according to the things done in the books, whether they be good or whether they be bad. Daniel Webster, the great orator, I was asked one time, what's the most serious and solemn thought that you ever entertained in your mind, Mr. Webster? Without a moment's hesitation, he said, to think that one day I must stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give account for the things I've done in my body, whether they're good or bad. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a sobering thought. And this is exactly where you will stand. That's where I will stand. That's where we will stand one of these days. Second Corinthians chapter 5, Paul says this, that every man must give account for the things done in his body, whether they're good or bad. But I've got to give an account to that old clock. It says I've got to go. I appreciate the way you're listening. Tune us in in the morning at 5 o'clock, this time tomorrow evening at 4.30. Until then, this is Don Rudd saying have a good afternoon. You have just heard a gospel program with Mr. Don Rudd. Listen each weekday afternoon at 4.30 and each weekday morning at 5 o'clock.